The Royal Statistical Society um, gives out a number of awards for excellence, uh, not merely within statistics, but also in disciplines related to statistics, including honorary fellowship, award for excellent statistical journalism, uh, and one or two other things. But the, what you might call the core awards of the society uh, are a set of medals named in honour of one of our former presidents, William Guy, 1873 to 1875. And uh, these are in gold, silver and bronze, but I would just like to emphasise that then this is not for first, second and third place. Uh, it, very roughly speaking, the, the, the bronze medal is, is aimed at early uh, career statisticians. The gold uh, medal is the closest we have to a lifetime achievement award. The silver medal is awarded, and I quote from the regulations, annually to any fellow for a paper or papers of special merit communicated to the society at its ordinary meetings or published in any of its journals. And for the guests of the society, I should emphasize that the word ordinary meetings, uh, in terms of the, their um, contribution to the discipline, they're actually very special meetings. Uh, and one of the great traditions of the society is to organize up to 10 meetings a year at which a paper is read, open discussion follows, and the entire proceedings, which can often run to as many as 30 or more written contributions, appear in the society's journal. And a lot of the major breakthroughs in statistics um, have first seen the light of day in these meetings. Uh, and I would like to, um, at this point, uh, embarrass one of our, our, our company, uh, because one of those papers in 1972 introduced what is broadly known as the Cox Proportional Hazards Model. Uh, and as uh, many of you will know, uh, David Cox, who's with us today, is the first recipient of the International Prize in Statistics, which is the closest the statistics discipline is likely to get uh, to a, a Nobel. And I'm sure everyone wants to join me in congratulating David on this success. contribution to the press release, uh, which is that our American colleagues uh, referred it to as the statistical equivalent of the Nobel Prize. Uh, <laughs> so I changed uh, the spelling. Um, now, the other connection between that, well, there are several connections, actually, because, uh, uh, but, but one of the connections is that although the, the formal wording is for a paper presented at a meeting, in practice, that's always accompanied by a body, often a very considerable body, uh, a broader body of work. Uh, and I say that because uh, the particular award I'm going to hand out now uh, to Professor Nancy Reed, who's with us and will be speaking after um, the interval in her capacity as the Fisher Lecturer. Um, the formal citation reads that it's for her path-breaking paper, path Parameter Orthogonality and Approximate Conditional Inference, written jointly with Sir David Cox, which is one of the most highly cited and influential papers in the Society's journals within the last 30 years. The reward also recognises Nancy Reed's many other important contributions to statistical theory and methodology, including composite likelihood methods, design of experiments, survival analysis and saddle point approximations, and her outstanding leadership of and service to the statistical research community. Uh, so please, Nancy, I'd be honoured if you'd just come and accept the Guy Medal of Silver. final session of today's meeting uh, and I should introduce myself. I'm Walter Bodmer. Uh, I more or less started life as a statistician thanks very much to David Cox's influence and then uh, switched largely to genetics. But I'm here because I was a student of R.A. Fisher's and as a result of that I've been a chairman of the committee set up to honour Fisher uh, for I think nearly 40 years, rather too long. And just to let, you, let me remind you that the committee was set up after he died in order, in the words that we have, to promote interest in the life and work of the great statistician, evolutionary biologist and geneticist, Sir Ronald Elmer Fisher, to maintain his scientific legacy 
by encouraging discussion of the scientific fields in which he was active. So we largely alternate between genetics and statistics, and often we have things that bridge both fields, as you might uh, well expect to be the case. And one of our uh, uh, duties, one of the things we do, is to organize periodic Fisher Memorial lectures, usually on average once every year, once every 18 months, and we try and do that in association with a meeting with one of the societies that sponsors uh, the Fisher Committee, the Royal Society, the Biometric Society, Genetical Society, and the Royal Statistical Society. And so it's a great pleasure to have this meeting now, uh, as you've heard, as a joint activity between the Fisher Committee, and in this case, the RSS and the London Mathematical Society. And in this case, I, I'm very honored and pleased to be able to introduce uh, our, our Fisher Memorial Lecture. It's the 35th lecture, uh, and you've already heard a lot about Nancy Reed and her accomplishment in statistics. I, I don't really need to repeat those. She's had a stellar career as a statistician in Canada. She's been a professor and a major contributor to statistics uh, in Toronto since 1986. She's had many awards, including the Statistical Society of Canada uh, Gold Medal. Um, she's been elected a Fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, uh, and notably this year uh, was elected as a Foreign Associate of the National Academy of Sciences. So Nancy, it's a great pleasure to invite you to give the 35th Fisher Lecture. Much. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. I, I feel I started my career here in London at Imperial College, where I was very, very fortunate to do a postdoctoral fellowship, and it's a real pleasure to come back after so many years. Uh, we've congratulated uh, David, and this picture was all over the internet last week when he, when he won the International Prize in Statistics, and, and I happen to know that it's a picture he likes uh, particularly because of this equation <laughs> that's behind him. And, and it's the, this is the, uh, uh, one of the key equations in our paper that, uh, for which uh, I was awarded today the silver medal. So life is full of odd coincidences, if you like, or circumstances that surprise one. I thought this picture of David might be a bit too overwhelming, and I, was, I, I actually cropped it about halfway up so it wouldn't kind of dominate the room. But it seemed very appropriate that he has a pen in his hand, <laughs> so I left it as is. Uh, it, it, some mathematicians like to brag about their Erdos number. Uh, I'm in the wrong um, community to brag about my Fisher number, uh, but in Canada it's kind of a big deal among statisticians, and my Fisher number is one, because uh, my husband and longtime collaborator uh, corresponded with Fisher, and these letters were collected in, in, in a volume published in Australia. Uh, some years ago, uh, and I'm pretty sure the original's in our basement somewhere, but neither of us can face <laughs> actually searching for it. Uh, and uh, it was kind of interesting uh, to just to reflect a little bit. Uh, well, I read all the letters, and they were really, I found them fascinating, because of course Don was a young man at that time, and Fisher was giving him very kindly advice. And it was also a little of the more things change, the more they stay the same. Uh, it was good to see your paper in the annals for that journal needs the injection of a little sense and relevance. <laughs> I think we could agree on that. <laughs> um, and also that it goes on to discuss something that we still seem to be uh, talking about. Uh, he, he challenges Don to say, what did you actually mean by the frequency interpretation for confidence intervals? And David and I wrote about this in a paper we presented to the ISI about three years ago. Uh, and, uh, of course, he's uh, presenting two of the most popular interpretations in this letter. And another one of life's pleasant coincidences in a later letter, he says to Don, please do not forget to look up Walter Bodmer, who also has some experience being balled down by the Neimanians. <laughs> you can tell us later if that's really true. <laughs> um, okay, when, well, when Peter uh, contacted me, um, he suggested that I might talk about some aspect of big data, which was wise because big data is a big topic and it seems to be everywhere, but it's also a little bit hard to know 
what aspect to talk about. Um, in, in some ways, uh, when you say talk to young people, uh, they think of big data as uh, big machines, lots of computing, um, the Google DeepMind challenge in March of this year, for example, complex architectures, uh, and kind of gets associated with computer science. This is a picture of the Institute for Data Science at uh, Imperial College with their 64 monitors in a semicircular array and so on. Uh, and it, small data, by contrast, seems to be kind of out of style or out of date. It's, uh, you know, kind of lots of equations and mathematical models, and you don't really need a very big computer. And it tends to get equated, I'm sorry to say, with statistical science. So I, I, I started thinking a little bit more about how to uh, bridge the gap. I think there's, so these are, this is perhaps a stylization, but um, maybe more damaging uh, big data is somehow considered to be very, very uh, interesting and incredibly detailed and very informative and really uh, so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it was small data is kind of, sort of <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, to try to counteract this um, prevailing ethos, if it is one, uh, we organized in, in 2015 a six-month uh, thematic program on statistical inference learning and models for big data. We, we, when I say we, it's a group of uh, organizers, an international organizing committee and as well a national organizing committee. And uh, the, the Fields Institute actually asked us to organize a program on big data, and we were the ones who injected the statistical in to try to see, well, where is the interface and what can statisticians bring to the table? Because we all feel we have a lot to offer, but somehow we wanted to really study this more carefully and see how to get the message out. So some of what I'll talk about today, and in fact a good Part of what I'll talk about today is things that I learned or highlights that I took away from this thematic program, which already seems a bit out of date because it was a whole year and a few months ago that we ran the program and things are moving so quickly that it's, it is hard to keep up. Uh, and we, we started planning for it even in, in 2013. Uh, that's when we first started planning the program and figuring out what to do. And we were actually quite nervous that by the time we ran the program in 2015, big data would be out of fashion already and something else would have come along. <laughs> uh, so when, it, when we started to look at it, I found this uh, some, something I didn't know existed until I got into this world. It's called the Gartner hype cycle. And this was the one for 2013. And big data is right at the top of this cycle. It's at what's called the peak of inflated <laughs> expectations. So uh, we were, I guess, at the right moment, but it d doesn't look good, right, for <laughs> time marching on. And indeed, by 2014, it had sunk down a little bit towards the trough of disillusionment. Um, it, by 2015, it was actually gone from the hype cycle altogether because they said it had become so ubiquitous that it wouldn't be treated as a separate topic anymore. Um, but machine learning uh, did, did gain a new place on this. So this is kind of, I think, from the business world, this aspect of um, what's happening is, has more influence than it would on academics who tend to take the longer view. And then, of course, there's the pushback. You may, may have been at uh, Tim Harford's lecture in 2014 um, and, and the paper that he wrote up, uh, Big Data, Are We Making a Big Mistake? And this was uh, a pushback that I think we're, we're familiar with. Um, more data doesn't mean it's good data, and more data doesn't mean uh, it represents the population better, for example. Um, very small standard errors uh, maybe don't mean what they seem to mean on the surface. So there's those aspects. There's also concerns perhaps about privacy. And um, I think this, this was a wonderful phrase at the uh, closing of Tim's lecture, big data has arrived, but big insights have not. And, and that, that was kind of aha for me because we're starting this uh, program in big data and I feel like statisticians are good at getting insight from data. Um, there's been, been a more recent pushback that's getting tremendous amount of press. You may have read 
Kathy O'Neill's book or glanced at it or heard the podcast on The Guardian, uh, uh, more or less treated a, a related aspect of this. And this quote is taken from the uh, podcast, the more or less podcast. If an assessment never asks about race, how could the algorithm throw up racially biased results? Well, we know how it can. It, it asks about your income. It asks about your friends. Have any of your friends ever been stopped by the police? It asks about your neighborhood and so on. What school did you go to? And those are all, of course, proxies, in, in some settings, proxies for race. And uh, one of the quotes from the uh, Guardian article is that credit scores are used by nearly half of American employers to screen potential employees. So this is a more serious type of pushback, I think, um, a, a little bit more worrisome in the sense that um, it's th these, uh, these algorithms are processing data, but people aren't, aren't challenging the algorithms to see if what they produce makes sense. People are taking refuge in the fact that an algorithm processed the data. So your bank manager is not allowed to discriminate against you in giving you credit, but an algorithm is allowed to discriminate against you indirectly in not giving you credit. And so the subtitle of the book is How Big Data Threatens Democracy and Increases Inequality. Of course, it doesn't have to be this way, and I think mathematicians and statisticians and computer scientists can speak out and, and, and think of ways to use the data more ethically. Okay, so I'll come back to the program and a nod to the sponsors. The lead sponsor was the Canadian Institute for Statistical Sciences, which is a relatively new entity in Canada. Um, that uh, fosters collaboration between statisticians and scientists, and we get a lot of funding from our mathematical sciences institutes. So here's a list of the workshops that were held at the Fields Institute. I felt that it was a very hectic schedule uh, until the Turing Institute started up, and they had 30 scoping workshops in within about 12 months, so it, this seemed quite relaxed Canadian pace by comparison, but uh, we did have the first workshop was two weeks long and each of these were a week so it was a fairly concentrated uh, effort and I, I've highlighted in blue um, well except for the opening conference which is kind of an introductory session we had themes that we felt were kind of cross-cutting or foundational machine learning optimization and visualization and then we had uh, two thematic emphases in more applied work health policy and social policy among many, many, many that we could have chosen, of course. Um, I mention these in particular because all the lectures for every workshop are available uh, through the field's website, and it's a very nice resource. We did have workshops off campus as well across the country on uh, uh, the applied areas and cross-cutting areas. Uh, networks um, was our another um, cross-cutting area that we looked at and statistical theory for large-scale data, environmental science, uh, space-time data, and banking. Um, so what I'm going to do now is just capture a few of what for me were highlights of these various workshops in the hopes um, that they give a flavor of at least one way of involving statistical science in big data into data science and, and mapping certain possibilities for the future. So the opening conference was an introduction to all the topics at the following workshops, one on each day. And nearly every lecture started with something like, my data is bigger than your data, or I don't really know if my data counts as big, <laughs> uh, and that sort of thing. But the best quote uh, that, that I liked was um, uh, taken from Justice Potter Stewart who said, I shall not today attempt further to define the kinds of material I understand to be embraced within that shorthand description. You can see that a statistician could never have written that. <laughs> and perhaps I could never succeed, but I know it when I see it. And, and uh, Robert Bell, who gave the plenary opening lecture, uh, highlighted this quote, which I then extracted in, in length. He was actually talking not about pig data. He was talking about obscenity. This was <laughs> a pornography uh, challenge <laughs> in, in the 1960s. Um, so then we had the, the meat of the workshops, uh, machine learning, and, and uh, followed by two more cross-cutting areas, and then our policy implications. 
And so what I learned uh, finally at the statistical machine learning workshop was what a restricted Boltzmann machine is. In Toronto, the machine learning group is extremely famous. Uh, Geoffrey Hinton is their leader. He was at University College London for some years, and he's always on the radio and the TV and, and talking about deep learning, and, and they have a lot of fancy words that we've somehow not managed to compete with. And one of them is restricted Boltzmann machine. It's not as complicated as I thought. Uh, this slide I, I borrowed from Mu Zhu, who gave a lecture on this. And uh, basically, you could think of the bottom layer of, of eight nodes as nine nodes as being inputs, and the top layer are some outputs. And the, but the model that I've written here is for the joint distribution of the inputs and the outputs, and it's simply a special type of Markov random field. Uh, and we saw this in the talks before the tea break, this uh, same type of structure, although in, inside the exponent was uh, something actually more complicated because all possible connections were allowed, whereas in this version, the connections across the H's or the V's have been taken away. So we're looking at some uh, parameters related to the inputs, parameters related to the outputs, and then the links between them. Of course, this, these are the parameters of interest that link the inputs to the outputs. Um, and uh, a natural way to, say, maximize the log of this density uh, computationally is to use what the computer scientists call natural gradient descent, but what we would call Fisher scoring, which is simply to update the parameter by taking the gradient of the log likelihood function and uh, weighting it by the inverse information. And this has a long history in statistics using the Fisher information as a metric tensor started by C.R. Rao in 1945 and developed uh, by Amari and others and, and uh, appears recently in work by Mark Girolami and Ben Calderhead. Uh, the the uh, particular talk that I'm referring to by Roger Gross uh, is mainly concerned with the fact that this inverse matrix is very difficult to compute because it's very high dimension. And so he had a, a, they have quite a clever way of using a Gaussian graphical model approximation to force a sparse inverse. This is, uh, if, you, if you're a little bit worried because it's late in the day and this is a lot of math, this is almost the most math I have. So, that's, uh, But I did want to give a nod to something that we've been looking at for a very long time. But in this unfamiliar setting, it's not always so obvious um, uh, how, to, how to relate it back. Um, now, as you might imagine, if, you're, if it's late in the day and you like to work late, you could take a piece of paper and show that uh, the model for H given V, especially if there's just one H and it's binary, would be a logistic regression. And you, and you would get rid of the, the uh, partition function or the normalizing constant here um, by looking at that. The, the, um, and the, the logistic regression would have a log odds parameter in it that would not require you to compute the partition function. And that's true even if several of those top nodes are binary and you condition on the bottom nodes and all the other nodes, then you'll still get a logistic regression and the odds ratio only depends on V. So that's bringing it back to a more familiar statistical um, uh, modeling perhaps. But the computational modeling is that the, they, they will stack these Boltzmann machines up so the Vs the H's on the top layer become V's for another layer and another layer, and they might have about 10 layers. And they don't have nine inputs, uh, but several million inputs on each layer, or several hundred or tens. And, and then uh, the estimation of the parameters and the, the optimization becomes really a, a problem uh, in uh, computational and optimization techniques. And just to illustrate that, I've, I've turned a, a Muju slide on its side there to show the bottom nodes on the left in the, in the upper right corner and the top nodes on the right. And here's a, a snapshot taken from a paper in bioinformatics that shows various different uh, bottom nodes feeding into hidden layers, which become then inputs for the final output layer. And Brendan Fry, uh, as part of the Infinite Genomes Project, has used this to great success to combine cell properties with genetic information to predict the function of the uh, um, different genetic differences. Um, so um, 
Well, I mentioned that fitting these models, of course, is going to be a problem in optimization, so our next workshop was indeed on optimization. And a classical, statistically friendly version of this is to maximize the log likelihood function. Uh, but I've here penalized the log likelihood function by some function of the parameters uh, as a, um, something that comes up all the time in high dimensional inference. So if you like, you could think of the, the log as being the least squares distance, so dis uh, weighted least squares between the data and the model. And that you could think of this as uh, penalizing the, the sum of the squares of the parameters in that regression model, and then it would be called ridge regression. Uh, very popular nowadays is to use something called the lasso penalty, which is to penalize the sum of the absolute values. And what I learned is that you can now confidently say to your friends that the one norm is a convex relaxation of the zero norm, which I didn't know before. Uh, the zero norm counts how many of the thetas are not zero, and the one norm uh, sums up the absolute values. And the lasso penalty is very, very popular because the, it has the feature that the solution of this maximization problem sets a lot of the components of theta to zero. So it's like a model selection at the same time as a model fitting. And for that reason, it's very popular. In a sense, you might like to use this penalty. We don't want too many non-zero entries, but that would make the problem non-convex. So this one is a kind of compromise the one I described in words was an L2 norm, which is just a kind of smooth shrinking of everything towards the origin. Uh, many interesting penalties are non-convex, so there is, of course, a development of optimization in non-convex settings, but it's computationally it's extremely difficult, um, it, mainly because the optimization routines uh, don't usually find the global optimum because there, there are lots of local optima and the, the first versions of neural networks were famously bad at this in the sense that, uh, for example, in Venables and Ripley on their chapter on neural networks, they say, well, when you're fitting one of these, uh, choose new starting values and fit it again and do this several times because you'll probably get a different answer each time. And for a statistician, that's like, well, that's weird. Why aren't we getting the right answer? But it has to do with the very non-convex nature of the function you're trying to optimize. But there was a very interesting um, set of work coming out of Berkeley that contrasts the statistical error, that is the difference between the true value of your parameter and your estimate of it, with the approximation error, which is the error that you get by not getting to the, ab to the absolute maximum value. And at least in some settings, the statistical error is much larger than the approximation error. So that's a good thing because now it really you can really make progress with an algorithm that doesn't necessarily converge to the um, true value of the maximum likelihood estimate because it gets close enough, if you like. And I only know of two, I, I, it's my ignorance, I know of two papers on this, uh, a, a very nice talk by Martin Wainwright and uh, at least two papers by Lowe and Wainwright. I'm sure there's much more but I haven't, I haven't seen it exploited in the statistical literature too much yet, although I think it's probably important enough to, to consider in more detail. Uh, I'm gonna move now to the visualization workshop. This was the most fun. It was really, really interesting, uh, uh, interesting collection of people and uh, ideas and so on. Um, and a cross-cutting theme that, that statisticians don't spend too much time in. There's the statistical graphics, of course, and uh, cl the classic book by Edward Tufte, uh, and a more recent book here by Hadley Wickham, ggplot2. Uh, so ggplot2 is a kind of, um, gg stands for the grammar of graphics, and it's a way of thinking about the pieces that go in to your graphical display. Uh, and I, I think that uh, it's hard to make progress in statistical graphics as a discipline until you start really thinking about those different pieces. Um, interestingly, Tufte's book, although it's from 1983, is still used as the main introductory book 
in information visualization classes in computer science, as far as I can tell. Um, but InfoViz is a bit different than statistical graphics. It's more about uh, displaying information in, in different and interesting ways. And scientific visualization is maybe a little bit different again. And we had representatives from all these communities at the same workshop. And of course, they all use aspects of cognitive science and design. But it was really quite interesting to see how all these people don't really talk to each other. And that's a, a, this came up so many times in, um, during the, the program that you would see the same ideas coming up in different contexts. And then you'd say, well, you should be talking to you. <laughs> and we should get together again. And yes, yes, we should, but everyone's busy. It's, it's much harder than we think to do multidisciplinary research and, and much harder than our administrators realize, I think. Um, but I, I, there, there are, they, do, they each have slightly different uh, takes on this. I, if I had to be very rough and, or broad-based, I would say the statistical graphics are not that nice to look at. <laughs> um, but the data's quality. And the information visualization are gorgeous to look at. But where the data comes from is not such a big concern. You know, <laughs> so, um, and so I could hardly be in England and in London and not talk about this uh, visualization laboratory. And so I did spend some time on their web pages. And I can hardly be in Canada and not think about the US election, unfortunately. So, um, so I did zero in on one of their uh, um, case studies. And this is, uh, I haven't shown you the whole uh, uh, snapshot from the web page here. And I don't have, I don't know very much about the text around it, but it's in a sense, if the visualization is good, it should tell us uh, almost by itself. So I've cut off the word cloud because actually it wasn't that different between uh, um, uh, Trump and Clinton. Uh, Trump is red, sorry, and uh, Clinton is blue. Um, and this is a Clinton fingerprint in the top. It's got a lot of little blue dots on it. And in the bottom is a Trump fingerprint with a lot of little red dots. And personally, I can't really see very much to distinguish between them, sadly. Um, it's maybe more a reflection of how debates go nowadays in the US than, than their positions. But, um, and this is a kind of, as far as I understand, a merging of them. And, and I, uh, where there's white, presumably, there's, there's a quite a bit of overlap and where there's blue or red. There's so, so there's a lot of blue in the bottom left corner, which is hard for you to see. That refers to politics. And that, so it's um, maybe a more um, serious discussion of politics from the Clinton camp, you might say. Um, a lot of uh, red, uh, well, a lot, some red under the family uh, ellipse and so on. Of course, now I, I mentioned the, the InfoViz people and the SciViz people and statistical graphics. This is something different. Again, these are text miners. Uh, and and they, so they've drilled through uh, and assimilated lots of text and trying to find commonalities around it. Of course, a statistician would say, well, what do those ovals really mean? And you know, should they be ovals or should they be, have really fuzzy boundaries and so on? Those are all problems that need, still need to be addressed. But I, I, I do confess without meaning to be overly critical that I find this visualization immediately much more um, informative it's, a it's addressing a different problem, of course. This is uh, county electoral college votes. And uh, you can see that it looks a little bit like the United States, but it's enough distorted that it can't really be. And each state has been resized according to the number of electoral college votes that it holds. This is more reassuring than the original map uh, colored uh, red and blue, because there's a surprising amount of red in the middle. And you do. Um, well, in Canada, we do wonder how that could be. But um, and this one, I thought also a very like just kind of different and and, and quite original um, as a sort of the path to cross the line, and rather reassuring, I would say, uh, because the the line that, uh, which Clinton needs to cross is in the middle there, um, and uh, it's looking well as of a week ago. It was looking all right uh, when when I came out this morning. One of the um, tabloid newspaper said that it's a lot closer than we think, so perhaps it is. Um, 
An another uh, thing I learned uh, in the visualization, which is uh, just a completely different way of looking at things, but I think is important, a journalist uh, from the New York Times came to speak, and he used the phrase, the duty of beauty, that kind of stayed with me for a long time. Uh, and But his, his focus was more on using visualization to tell stories. So I think there's a really interesting interplay all the way from statistical graphics through to art, if you like. And, uh, and there's a, a, um, a snapshot, which is, it's a dynamic graph from the New York Times, and I won't try to, my luck with the internet here to show it to you, but it, if you have some idle minutes it, when you get tired of Facebooking, um, Google Front Row to Fashion Week, and you can have a lot of fun just looking at this visualization which is strikingly beautiful. Um, and whether the data is of particular interest depends on your interests, of course. It might be of interest to marketing groups or to people who study fashion. Um, but uh, it, it's, it's an example of the sorts of things that very creative people with a sense of the duty of beauty can, can uh, convey. Um, I'll move now to the uh, health and social policy workshops and just highlight a few of the key things that came up from that. I'm going to emphasize what we call in, in Ontario the ISIS data. In Canada, healthcare is organized by province, um, much to many people's dismay because it doesn't work all that well, but uh, it is organized by province. And in my home province of Ontario, um, the Institute for Clinical and Evaluative Sciences has access to all the uh, Ontario government insurance health data. Record level coded linkable health data sets uh, encompassing much of the publicly funded administrative health services records for the Ontario population. So these are, and, and so one major focus in health policy of course is databases like this. The National Health Service database was mentioned earlier today and uh, oh, maybe not earlier for you today. I was at the Turing this morning. I think it was mentioned there. Um, but I just wanted to, to notice the, the, the lock, <laughs> or the keyhole, rather, <laughs> um, on, on this. Uh, this is the main graphic from their website. And the full website uh, has uh, prominently uh, uh, mentions data and privacy. Of course, it's in the um, area of health that privacy concerns become maybe more, uh, the most uh, immediate. Um, the, the person giving the talk from ISIS is a friend of mine, and she says, I have a record of every, every live birth at Women's College Hospital from such and such a date to such and such a date. And I thought, well, wait a minute, I, I'm in that database, <laughs> and I don't think I want you looking at my data. <laughs> um, but conversely, I, people are often willing to share their data if they feel that there is going to be a greater good for themselves and, and for others. People will share very personal data about their health uh, if, if the, the goal is to find a cure for something they're suffering from, for example. But privacy is a, a, a big issue that's not near to being solved. Excuse me, not near to being solved, I think. Um, and so this is Teresa's talk, uh, a slide from her talk. And I'll just circle the de-identified. It's, a, it's a, a globally unique data repository and it's been de-identified. So she can't find out that it was me that gave birth on that particular day because it's been de-identified. Well, I'll come back to that in a minute, but in social policy, some of the same issues came up. And just as we were um, starting the program, uh, both Science and Significance published things about privacy. Science, this was more dramatic, the end of privacy significant subtitle is the future of privacy. And so this, is, this was also something that played a prominent role in, in our discussions of social policy. So I'm coming back to this slide de-identified because the uh, Privacy Commissioner of Ontario this uh, two summers ago um, published this position paper, uh, Big Data and Innovation. Uh, de-identification does work and it does, it is emphasized within a week um, that uh, two uh, computer scientists had published a repost that said it doesn't work. Um, and it's, it's really, well, I don't know who's right, 
but they're talking in a sense about two different things. Um, statisticians are really comfortable thinking about statistical disclosure limitation. Statistical agencies, um, in, at least in the developed world, have, have had to be very, very careful about releasing uh, to the public data that might identify uniquely individuals. So they have many, many, many checks and balances. But computer scientists come from a world of crypto cryptography, and they like to break things, <laughs> more or less. So uh, the computer science approach is maybe from a differential privacy or multi-party <coughs> communication point of view. And it's, I think there's just a lot of work to be done in trying to, again, bring these rather disparate points of view together. I think that the um, computer science work on this aspect of privacy ignores uh, a very long and, and really esteemed history of statistical disclosure limitation. Statistics Canada will insist has never had a privacy breach in, during its existence. Mind you, partly that's because until a year or two ago they kept the data under lock and key and we never got to see it. Or if we wanted to see a summary, we had to pay a lot of money. And so people went to the US and got data where it was free. <laughs> um, it's still rather restricted. You have to go to a, sp a specific site. So there's, there's uh, somehow we want to make data available to many people. We don't want to uh, disclose information that shouldn't be disclosed. And that's a, a, a conundrum that needs a lot of people involved. Um, well, that took us, us, it took you in 40 minutes through uh, about 15 weeks of intense uh, discussions. Um, and uh, of course, I've only highlighted one topic from each uh, week-long workshop, but there were many, many interesting things to look at. Um, there were a lot of things that we left out. Uh, inference, environmental science, and networks we did look at uh, in more detail, but not at the Fields Institute. Um, that those took place uh, off-site. Um, but we didn't do any um, particular emphasis on uh, the, the omics world of biology, obviously extremely important, uh, really not very much in finance. We didn't touch uh, physical sciences. We didn't discuss software or hardware infrastructure. So there's so many other things that one could do. It's sometimes almost overwhelming. Um, so what did we learn from all this? Well, it's a little, I, I should say, what did I learn really? But um, I, I, I think, well, we in the sense of myself and our students and the people in, in residence for the whole program. Um, one thing is that the, the, the statistical models tend to be uh, very complex and high dimensional. And actually we have a, a lot of experience with that. People have been fitting complicated models, a little bit too complicated for the data at hand for a long time. And uh, we, we, um, we've studied lots of aspects of this. There are still many open problems. But um, so it's not so much that the data is big that the N is large, it's that the P is large, uh, roughly speaking, to, to use the language of before a tea break. Um, there's, uh, of course, now when the N is large and even when P is large, computational challenges are ginormous. And uh, I think that statistical inference can get a bit lost. Um, in, in some settings, though, it, it would be completely appropriate to uh, emphasize prediction. But in other settings, I think there, there, was, there, there would be some interest in coming back and seeing what can be learned in terms of inferential properties, even if the model is not quite perfect. Um, and I think uh, data owners are um, very quick to realize that they have a lot of data that they can't handle because their laptop won't work, um, but a little bit uh, slower to, to realize that um, as, uh, modeling this data is going to be tricky. It's going to have a lot of missing entries, as we've heard. Um, it ha have a structure that we don't understand very well. Um, you might end up putting in too many parameters and not being sure if you can identify them and so on. And I think uh, as the uh, program on big data ended, uh, data science was then in the ascendant. It's kind of a new word to cover big data. Um, so th this slide I made really at the end of the program, but it's, I still think it's what we learned. And um, 
since then, of course, data science has exploded, and in just the last year or two, it's, it's taken off. So what is it exactly? <laughs> well, um, at Berkeley, they give a, a freshman first year course. Um, I believe it's the case that all the students in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences are required now to take this course. So that's, that must be three or 4,000 students each year. And it's called Foundations of Data Science. And I, if I'm not mistaken, this is the first year it's being given. And it was created with, uh, jointly with a statistician and uh, a computer scientist. Well, I, I should say a team of statisticians and a team of computer scientists. It's being taught this fall by Annie Adekiri, Adekari and uh, Michael Jordan. Uh, we're rushing through an undergraduate program proposal in data science, and we have a set of courses. Uh, and I just, I haven't paid a lot of detailed attention to the proposal, but um, uh, I, I noticed when I went to look at it more carefully that this template has been developed in line with the University of Toronto's quality assurance process. Uh, <laughs> in case you thought universities were becoming like businesses, <laughs> we even have QAP. Um, uh, there's many websites like this. Um, uh, that will convert you into a data scientist in six weeks or six months or uh, uh, it, it's, is it a technology, a new field of research, a collaboration? I think these three are being combined in, in data science institutes. This is uh, taken from the Institute at Imperial College. There's, of course, there's many. There's the one in Paris and the Turing Institute that I visited this morning. Um, so I, I think uh, Probably it's, it's all of these things, but in terms of uh, academic research and research for statisticians, maybe the, the new field of research and the collaboration part is, is of more interest. Um, but of course, for universities, the, the courses and the programs are very important because everyone in the outside world is thinking that they need to hire a data scientist, so the universities are under pressure to produce data scientists. In, in around uh, 1990, well, I was chair of a uh, department of statistics from 97 to 2002, and the government thought it needed lots and lots of computer scientists, and they poured a lot of money into computer science to train more students. And then the dot-com bubble burst in 2000, and the computer science department had lots of faculty and no students to teach for some years. So things do go south. <laughs> But they do come back. Computer science is now thriving, I'm glad to say, uh, as is statistical science. And so I hope that data science will continue to thrive. But it is, it is hard to be sure. Um, so in our program, we're, uh, I've just listed the, the topics that we're emphasizing, uh, which are kind of probably pretty standard to every data science program. And I just put them up because I wanted to highlight some of the things that statisticians I think are good at, I've, I've colored those in blue. Um, and, and then of course we obviously need a lot of uh, collaboration with computer science for machine learning, for programming, development, algorithms, and a data structure. It, data structure, it's hard to say I could have colored that in blue, it depends what you mean, but databases, for example, would be in computer science. So it's clear that we feel that we need our students to learn a lot more computation and so they have to learn a lot less something else. And that something else seems to be, this is the wrong place to say at the London Mathematical Society meeting, but it does seem to be mathematics that's getting somewhat short shrift. And perhaps that cycle will turn again and, and we'll realize we need a lot more mathematics. We're cutting back extensively on statistical theory as well and emphasizing methods, but also communication, visualization, and so on. Again, it depends, are we training students for the job market, or are we training them to think and be adaptable, and it's a, a discussion maybe for another day. Um, data science research, there does seem to be, I think, uh, as I've tried to highlight through our big data program, a lot of interesting things. I've, I've put the logo for the National Science Foundation there because they've just issued a call for proposals on uh, the theory of res uh, theoretical research in, and something in data science that's called tripods, and I don't remember exactly what it stands for. Principles and strategies, I think, for data science. So it's really focused on mathematics, statistics, and computational sciences, 
in, in advancing data science and it's, it's insisting on a collaborative model. And in as much as that steers the research effort to some extent in the US, I think we can expect it to be a focus for, for a certain amount of time. And of course, there needs to be a lot of attention as we've heard in many places on data collection and data quality, which we're very, very good at. Um, there's uh, uh, some people, and I've alluded to this, make a distinction between a large N and small P, in, in which case uh, it's computational strategies that are needed and, and uh, different software languages for distributing uh, uh, data to different processors and then recombining the results which really, when you recombine the results, you could profitably go back to Fisher, who wrote a very interesting paper on combining p-values from different experiments and combining uh, log likelihood summary statistics. Um, I think we've spent maybe a little bit too much time on, on the small and large, well, too much, it's hard to say. We've spent, I think, uh, a lot of um, research time on small and large p um, and various dimension reduction strategies. There's still a lot of work to be done. Um, there seems to be a new focus now on post-selection inference. So if you th think, uh, going back to the um, penalized log likelihood function, the goal is you have too many parameters, so throw in a penalty and your algorithm will come up with fewer parameters. So your problem had uh, more parameters than data and now you've got fewer parameters than data because you set a whole lot of them to zero. That's a, a one way of, of reducing the dimension. What do you do with the estimates you have left? Like what, what's their standard error? Um, there's a, a lot of interesting work going on now and even among statisticians, we can't quite seem to agree on what the right approach to uh, this type of inference is. Um, of course, when you have a lot of data, whether large P or large N, uh, then you see things that don't happen very often and then you ha immediately have small data, uh, like the uh, experiments at CERN. Uh, they're, they're looking for very, very small bumps in you know, un unimaginably large amounts of data. But the, the data that's of interest to them is actually quite small. So I think that uh, this uh, extreme inference for extremes in many different settings is, is going to be quite important. Uh, and uh, as we heard earlier today, there's so, so many new types of data. Networks and graphs we're kind of used to uh, a little bit. I mean, we, we do have a start at some models for networks and for graphs. Um, for text, really, we don't have any models. I was at another big data talk last week and a person said, what's the standard error of, of a word cloud? <laughs> what, what does it even mean? Uh, perhaps. That means we should throw out word clouds, I don't know. But uh, there's, there's um, I think we, we haven't come to grips with how to handle this. Images we sort of been handling for some time in, in different ways, but again, uh, it's uh, images that change in time, uh, video recordings. Um, Terry Lyons was telling me that this morning that um, Chinese character recognition can be used in analyzing uh, video tapes of people because they move like Chinese characters. Yes. <laughs> he can show you <laughs> all the Chinese and you can move at the same time, but I can't quite pull it off. But a completely uh, novel way to look at, at, at image processing. So I think we're just scratching the surface uh, there. Uh, collaboration and communication, uh, it's a, I think statisticians feel they're reasonably good at, at collaborating and communicating the results, but um, our students, I think it's fair to say, are not so good at that, m many of them. Um, and there's many aspects of data wrangling, uh, replicability and reproducibility. I've mentioned visualization. And then we need to get out, uh, of course, and, and try to have an impact on policy I mean, in some sense why, well, it depends on your field of interest, but there's so much interest in data and administrative data um, that of statistical scientists and computational scientists and mathematical scientists aren't talking to the outside world, we really will be, I think, missing a big opportunity. Uh, I, me I mentioned the replicability and reproducibility because there seems to be a kind of uh, a new wave of, of uh, data science scientists, there aren't very many of them, um, who teach courses that are 
quite different from the way I teach uh, in my, say, my applied statistics course. Um, and I, I just wanted to alert you to this kind of cute paper called Good Enough Practices in Scientific Computing. It is emphasized more on scientific computing, but I, I'm highlighting it because Jenny Bryan, uh, who's a colleague at the University of British Columbia, uh, teaches a course in the statistics department that really is data science. And she used to teach the course I teach, which is applied statistics. And my applied statistics course has a nice clean little data set. And then I say, oh, look, the y's are all zero and one. We better do something other than least squares. And then we work our way to logistic regression and, we, and they learn it. And she said, I just, every time I gave them a project, they couldn't find interesting data to analyze that wasn't a mess. So they spent so long cleaning the data that they never got their project finished. So I thought, well, I better teach them how to clean the data. <laughs> so in a sense, it's, it's morphed into a course on what we now call data science, where you download the data from the internet, put it in a format you can use, figure out how to visualize it, and, and the modeling really comes rather far downstream. Now, I'm too old for that, but I, at least Jenny gave me a very nice guide, and I would recommend her talk at the fields again, because um, she said, this is all you need to learn, and it's not that hard, and it didn't, when she said it, it didn't seem that hard. Um, but the, the sections of the Good Enough paper uh, talk about how to keep track of your data as you go from raw to the table you're going to analyze, um, good programming practices, um, uh, collaboration in the sense of, of version control uh, of, uh, of uh, papers, um, organizing projects and sub-themes. I mean, it's, it's not uh, a rocket science, as they say. It's all kind of sensible, but it has a very uh, crisp and clear guidelines for how to do this. And I think at least uh, we should be teaching this to our students as they go forward. And these are the words that seem to come up. Uh, these, are all, uh, these all refer to R functions <laughs> except for GitHub. GitHub is a intimidating repository of work that always keeps everything up to date. The others are all uh, um, features available in R or R Studio that an allow you to clean up your data and look at it, basically. Um, well, how do you see your area developing in the future? This is in quotes because I was on a panel discussion where I was asked to answer this question, and, and this is what I said, and this was before the big data program, but. It, I think it's still true. I think uh, new data scientists will discover that the old core is important. This is maybe wishful thinking, but I, I do hope that <laughs> theoretical statisticians continue to be in short supply. Um, I think we need a lot more translation than we've needed during my career as a statistician. It's getting to the edge of, uh, of a, Certainly for me, it's long past the edge, but even for my younger colleagues of being able to understand, say, all the talks in the department, which when, when I started out was, was easy to do. Um, so I think it will, it will be uh, increasingly difficult to uh, be a polystat. And, and not to forget, we still have a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of small data. Um, but I, I think its, its analysis will also be influenced by the trend to big data. Um, and then uh, I was bolstered. Um, the, uh, I came across something via Twitter um, that I, I'll highlight as a range of other problems. Mike Jordan is a um, machine learning expert and also an expert statistician. And uh, this was in an interview that he gave that eventually made it to a blog post. Um, well, I do think of neural networks, or you could say deep learning or whatever, as one important tool in the toolbox I find myself surprisingly rarely going to that tool when I'm out consulting. And I find that industry people are often looking to solve a range of other problems, not pattern recognition problems. Uh, well, yes, <laughs> we know that, right, as any statistical science, scientist will tell you. And these are the things he highlights that, uh, that these um, people are looking for. They, they need a way to, to process the data quickly. They're looking for meaningful error bars. That's kind of our thing. Um, they're looking to merge a lot of different sources of data, something maybe we've paid less attention to, um, to visualize and present conclusions, to know when they're going wrong. They're looking at things like non-stationarity. Things are changing, you know, this was, the, this was then and uh, what's happening now. And most interestingly, especially for me, because I, I, my first statistics course was design of experiments, and maybe my favorite one, 
they're looking to do targeted experiments within the databases, more complex than, than A-B testing, which everyone is doing now on, on, on your phone. Um, statisticians are often uh, criticized for um, being too cautious, and I think there's a lot in that. Um, we often are much too cautious for our own good, but it's not altogether a bad thing. I think there's, um, we do have a set of ethical guidelines, and I did notice with interest that none of the data science programs that I found, although I may have missed it, um, had ethics uh, as part of the uh, program, but um, I think there, th this uh, book is ob obviously meant to stir people up, and it is getting a lot of press, but that will be short-lived because it's a popular book and people's memories are short. But the backlash or the pushback, I think, is, um, is quite reasonable. And, and I think we need to pay attention to that. And I think we have something to offer in, in terms of uh, considering that. Uh, and just in case you think we shouldn't be cautious, I'll, here's what was in The Guardian on the 2nd of July. From, and this is taken from, I think, a government report, the Shakespeare report. From data, we'll get the cure for cancer as well as better hospitals, schools that adapt to children's needs, making them happier and smarter, better policing, safer homes, and, of course, jobs. Well, okay, <laughs> I hope so, but uh, I do think that, um, that that's, that's maybe uh, overstating it just a little bit. So, uh, um, and so I'll, I'll, I'll let, come back to the uh, Gartner hype cycle. This is now 2016, it's been published again. Big data is nowhere to be seen, but hooray, there's smart data. <laughs> the next big thing, you heard it here first. <laughs> uh, smart data discovery. Okay, I'm gonna stop there, thank you very much. <laughs>